This is for the Cambridge Baltic Society. I'm Robert Schiller of Yale University, sitting here on the Yale campus. I wish I could be there with you. Uh, this is a conference on education. I am not a professor of education. I'm a professor of economics. But I've, of course, been a professor. I've been here teaching at Yale University for 32 years, so I th should know something about education. Um, so I've been, th uh, I don't know what, to s what I will, what I should talk about here. I, I think um, I have long had a high respect for education and faith in its uh, possibilities. And I've been wondering uh, what formed me uh, uh, what kind of educational experience did I have? So I'm thinking back, uh, and since this is the Baltic Society, I suppose I should uh, say something about my Baltic roots. <coughs> uh, all four of my grandparents came from Lithuania between 1907 and 1911. So it's all over a hundred years ago. Uh, they all came separately and there was a Lithuanian community here, and my grandparents met here in the United States, and they continued to be part of a Lithuanian community, and that's how my parents met each other. They're, so it's, um, all of my grandparents are Lithuanian, but I've been here for 100 years. Uh, our family <laughs> has been here for 100 years. And I've often wondered what my values uh, I came from a family which respected education a lot, and I've often wondered what, uh, where these values came from. They probably have a longer origin than uh, my parents. Uh, they're partly American, of course, or mostly American, I suppose. But I, I can trace it further back. Uh, on my mother's side, I had a great uncle, Vinkas Chapinskis, who was a physicist. A professor of physics in Lithuania, and he worked on the periodic table with Dmitry Mendeleev, and later was Lithuanian ambassador to uh, London in the 1920s. So I think that's uh, a Lithuanian educational heritage. It's a sign of it. Uh, and uh, my my father uh, in the United States now went went to college here in engineering in the 1930s and he was supported by some other people he got like, effectively a scholarship but it was another lithuanian family that lent him the money to go to college which he had to repay then later but i always remember the story of this uh, other lithuanian family uh, so those are some of the um, uh, educational virtues that I suppose I got. I'm you know, also thinking that uh, my father uh, was both, well, he was, I boast about my father in this. He was a poet, an engineer, a scholar, all those things, and an entrepreneur. He started a company uh, which uh, didn't ultimately succeed, but that was uh, entrepreneurial. So where did that come from? I've been thinking, well, that's some American culture. And maybe it is. Maybe it's just American. But then I also see similarities between my father and grandfather. So I don't know. I think an entrepreneurial attitude is something that will grow if there's the right uh, attitudes, uh, discipline or uh, risk taking. Uh, I suppose all of my ancestors uh, that came to America were risk takers because they they came individually to another country. Uh, so, uh, uh, so anyway, just to bring this up, I, I, I've been teaching <coughs> economics and finance now at Yale for 32 years. And I have a feeling that I'm carrying on some tradition in my lectures. I'm not sure where I got it. One of the things I try to uh, instill in my students, I shouldn't say instill, but suggest, is something about values and uh, 
good, uh, good works and uh, also about entrepreneurship, that you are an individual. Uh, you are not here on this planet just to take orders. You are supposed to have your own spark. And uh, I've been teaching finance, which seems to me a particularly difficult, uh, well, it's a field that is criticized a lot. There are people who think that financiers are grasping and money hungry and that that's a field you would go into only if you valued money over anything else and didn't really care about people. Uh, that I idea has worsened after the financial crisis, so some people are really angry at finance. It's also heightened by the fact that some people make a lot of money in finance. But my attitude is that finance is an interesting field, and it's a, you know it's one of many very legitimate uh, fields of study. Uh, and there's always prejudices against <laughs> people who join one occupation or another. I think finance people tend to make a lot of money because because it's a powerful technology, at least at this point in history. Maybe they won't continue to make quite so much money. You know, these fields all have their ups and downs. And people who should, should go into what interests them. Also, I think that they should give back to society. And anyone, whatever, you could go into any of a number of fields and end up rich. And if that happens, you should give it back. And this is part of what I've been trying to instill uh, in, in teaching finance uh, at Yale. Um, I, I've been uh, teaching large classes at Yale University, which is kind of anomalous. I, my current class has 175 students. It's kind of anomalous because uh, you know, expensive uh, quality universities like to emphasize small classes. But it's worked out for me that I have large classes and nobody has to sign up for them. There are alternatives. Uh, but I've been getting a good uh, group of students. But I, I feel a certain loss, maybe, in teaching a large class because it seems like I don't really get to know students as well as I would like. And uh, that's a, um, maybe it makes teaching less rewarding in a way. But I've always felt democratic about it. Anyone who's enrolled at the university should be able to take my course. And I've never wanted to say no to someone just to keep class size down. Um, but I, th I was looking at some of your uh, questions here. Uh, and they, they maybe relate to issues like this. Let me just finish my uh, introductory remarks. I wanted to say that uh, after I won the Nobel Prize in economics, that was a year ago, uh, I came to Lithuania. And it was really a nice homecoming uh, because uh, I brought my family with me. They'd never been there. Uh, I was given a great reception. Uh, so I met uh, uh, Dalia Gribuskaita, and I met uh, Adamkas, um, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, what's his first Mr. Adamkas, who is uh, the former uh, president of Lithuania. Uh, what, who else did I meet? I met uh, Algirdis uh, Butkevicius. I met Juris Banis, the rector of Vilnius University. And I met Nerius Pachesa of uh, the ISM University of Management. Uh, and these are uh, important people that uh, gave me a very nice insights into uh, Lithuania. And I got an impression of a very lively uh, country and uh, advancing country. So. Uh, let me uh, go to some of the, of the questions that uh, um, I have a question from uh, Janis Brishka. Uh, and the question is, in this age of amazing technology and possibility to record video, are traditional style lectures still needed? Or would it be more time-saving to have online tutorials? 
This is really an uh, interesting question to me because that's also what I'm doing. I'm uh, currently teaching an online course in financial markets on Coursera, which is a venue for free online courses open to the world. I taught one last semester, and I had, uh, it's an interesting case, I had 190,000 students signed up from all over the world. Uh, only 8,000 finished the course, but people tell me that it, this high attrition is to be expected given that the course is free and lots of people sign up frivolously. Uh, but I had quite a large class in this. It was quite an experience. And I felt kind of bad because I hardly got to know them. I, there were too many of them. It, it was, I had this experience teaching uh, you know, something like 175 students here at Yale. There, it was teaching thousands of students, so there was just no hope of getting to know them. So I felt kind of a, a mixed feelings about the experience. I, I, I thought it was a good thing to do, uh, but uh, uh, I also felt on my side some sense of loss and a sense that maybe I'd really like to be teaching in a small class of eight students or something like that. Uh, but I think it's a reality that we're going to have both, that we're going to have both big classes and small classes. So uh, Mr. Brishka also says, uh, could video lectures take over in the future? Um, well, uh, I think not. <laughs> I don't think that they will take over completely. I'm thinking that, you know, this. Uh, you might have asked this question a couple thousand years ago when they invented books, or several, how many thousand years ago? Because once you have a book and have been taught to read, you could teach yourself. But I think there's always some desire to have uh, contact w with a person uh, because we're a social animal. And it's, it's, it, I think there are subtle transmissions that occur only through interpersonal contacts. Uh, I don't know any research to support this, but it seems that the kind of values you get or the kind of sense of purpose almost needs uh, direct personal contact. I don't suppose it has to be face to face. I don't know, I don't th but I would think not. But it involves somebody who knows who you are. Uh, so I, but I think uh, online services could facilitate that kind of uh, event as well. In fact, there are already is a model of some courses that are done like that online, where the class is kept small and the professor sees the students and knows them. Uh, and uh, this has been done, it's being done, and maybe that's more a model of the future. That it's really not disrupting ordinary classroom activity. Uh, it may, um, it may actually augment it and make it possible for people to become parts of classes without traveling. Uh, the other thing is I think that uh, maybe computers can help actually facilitate uh, continued relationships. I, I know that my students leave, and even the ones that I got to know best, they, they're maybe shy about coming back or uh, there's no routine for doing that. So I think that the social media somehow integrated into college education may improve the experience. Um, so uh, Mr. Brishka also asks, um, what is your view uh, on involvement of commercial organizations and nonprofits in the funding of higher education? So actually, yeah, there are essentially three different financing methods, government, nonprofit, and for-profit. All three of those are involved in higher education. Right now, it seems like the for-profit is somewhat beleaguered. There's concern that they are um, not, uh, uh, not doing well, that there has been deception, that some of the for-profits have deceived students about their job prospects and encourage them to run up debt to, to uh, take a uh, for-profit course. <coughs> so uh, that, that is a problem. 
On the other hand, I don't think that there's anything inherently wrong with for-profit education. Uh, it can work very, for-profit industries work very well. Maybe we have to get the incentive system worked out a little bit better. Uh, you, you, there, you, also, uh, uh, you also say, do you see principal agent conflicts at commercially funded schools? Yes, <laughs> we do. Um, uh, so I think that the model that the, 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 the nonprofit university is really an ancient model, uh, and it has worked very well. One thing I like about nonprofit university is that it involves uh, people in, um, in a sense of purpose, of in internalized purpose as professors rather than making money. Well, it's the same thing I was saying about finance. It's, there is a culture that has developed around nonprofit universities and government universities. Uh, I'm thinking particularly nonprofit because Yale, where I work, is, is not connected with the government. It's, a, it's its own entity, and it has its own culture, and there's no standardization. It's, it survives on its own culture, and I, I like that. But I think... Uh, there might be for-profit variations on it. So, for example, Coursera, which is running my online course, is for-profit. But I know they have considered changing their corporate charter so that they would become a benefit corporation, which is another kind of uh, corporation which is not strictly for-profit. It's really halfway between for-profit and non-profit. Benefit corporations are allowed now only in the United States, but other countries, I think, will probably adopt them before long. And this might be something for uh, Baltic countries to do eventually also. Because the human spirit is not well captured by just a money motivation, by just a for-profit motivation. Um, so uh, I have a question from Ingrid Karusalskaita. How could universities in the Baltic states more effectively collaborate with universities abroad? Well, I think that uh, collaborations, explicit collaborations, are relatively rare. Uh, and uh, so I, I don't have a model to, um, to do that. It would be more on an individual professor basis. Now, I know Yale University does have a uh, collaboration with the National University of Singapore. Uh, it also has a historic uh, relationship with, uh, well, there's something called Yale China. I think particularly Fudan University in China has had a long-standing relation with Yale. But I don't know that a lot, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of such uh, relations. Um, and so that's, um, something that could be worked on in the future, but uh, I, I just don't have a lot of examples of it. Uh, Ingrid also has a, another question. Could private or public education centers in the Baltic states team up to provide high-quality MOOCs? MOOC, that, that means Massive Open Online Course. That's what I, my financial markets course is an example of. Well, I think that sort of thing happens as well. Uh, we're working now with the University of Nebraska uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska, in the United States, to provide a version of my finance course, financial markets course, that will be involved, integrated into a course taught by a University of ne Nebraska professor. So uh, I think that it might be a good model. It might be a model in which the, there is individual attention given to the students through this professor. And uh, there's also some, uh, something coming from outside, uh, l my lectures in this case. Um, this is from Janis Strauds. How would you suggest improving the convoluted way teachers are evaluated now? And there's here uh, mes systems of gathering feedback from all partners, students, teachers, parents, uh, alumni. 
Well, uh, that's an interesting thought. I, I think that course evaluation as it works today is still imperfect. Uh, it just amounts to st students filling out questionnaires on their uh, faculty after they take the course. But it doesn't ask about long-term impact, and it doesn't, it doesn't assess whether what the professor taught was really useful. I'm thinking back to my own. I was an undergraduate at the University of Michigan, which was a government-run university. Uh, I had a great experience there. And I'm thinking back uh, now, it's been uh, the better part of half a century since I was there. But I am actually still thinking back to professors there who had uh, a real impact on me. Uh, I'm thinking of Professor Kenneth Boulding at Michigan, who. Uh, really saw a lot of purpose in economic. Uh, he was a very moral person, and it made me think that economics is something for the good of people, and it's not just uh, ac purely academic. And then uh, there was Professor George Katona from the psychology department there, who was doing research on really what we call now behavioral economics. And I think my brief interaction, it was, I never took a course from him. I just had a brief interaction with him. I never forgot it. And so I think it set me on a course. Uh, so I think this suggests um, that uh, evaluating, uh, I, I, some kind of long-term evaluation of teachers might be a good thing. Uh, the last question I have here is from Stefan Benchik. What are the crucial challenges to reforming active democratic c citizenship in post-Soviet countries through education. Uh, and that's, um, <laughs> that's a deep and important question. Uh, it seems like uh, uh, countries in the world differ in their appreciation of democratic principles. Uh, and. Uh, there's something uh, called civil society, which is stronger, it seems stronger in some countries than others. Civil society is a society made up of people who care about other people, who don't view themselves as isolated individuals, but as part of a society that has to be active in making things work right. They don't feel that they take orders from the government. Well, they follow the laws, but they're ready to change the laws or to protest laws that are inappropriate. And th that's something in a culture that uh, uh, is very important to teach. Uh, it's something that I, I uh, something I try to express to my students. I talk about civil society and its importance and what they sh should do. Uh, but I don't know that I have an answer to your question. The last question you have is, should universities in Baltic countries teach courses in English or native tongue? Uh, this reminds me, when I was a child, uh, I w my mother wanted me to learn Lithuanian, and she started to teach me Lithuanian. My father, however, who was also Lithuanian, he said, wait a minute. There's only a few million people in the world who speak Lithuanian, and we don't live in Lithuania. So he said, don't do it. So I had conflicting views from both of my parents. And I suppose there are these different views in the Baltic states as well today. The languages there are spoken by not very many, not very many million people. So my guess would be that it is important to learn foreign languages uh, at the university level in Baltic countries. Uh, but uh, I think you have a better reason to learn your native language because you live there. Uh, I actually do. Ashtapranto Lituvish guy, Truputi. Not very well. But it was sort of something spoken around our house. And I have a certain nostalgic feeling for the Lithuanian language. Uh, but I, I think that really the answer to the question of Mr. Benchik has to be, uh, it's something that you have to do both. There, there should be English language courses and native language courses. So that completes my questions. And uh, uh, thank you for your listening.